In this chapter, we glimpse Israel rejecting the Good Shepherd, Christ. We cite Israel accepting the worthless shepherd, Antichrist. We also glance Zachariah's day and his ability to play act and capture the attention of the people. We see Israel reject Messiah Jesus when he came, betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And this chapter will predict this treachery. But the fraud Messiah will come and Israel will accept him. They'll sign a seven-year peace treaty with him and believe him to be their deliverer. Late in this chapter, the Bible all but gives us a mugshot image of what Antichrist is going to look like. Let's continue this eye-opening 11th chapter of Zechariah, starting at verse 8. I dismissed or destroyed or cut off the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. There are literally dozens of different interpretations of this verse. John MacArthur said he knew of 40 different interpretations. And if you know John MacArthur, he'd happily spend several hours describing these 40 different views in detail. You want to find a verse of scripture Christians can't agree on? I present Zechariah 11.8 is one of the most disagreed on verses in scripture. This is certainly a verse of scripture you shouldn't be dogmatic about. It's very tricky. Let me add a 41st interpretation to the list, a position also presented by Chuck Missler. We'll need to go on a quick journey through scriptures to show where my mind travels when reading this verse. Firstly, let's go to Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar's multi-metallic dream, where he focuses on ten toes, you might remember, a mixture of iron and clay, the final form of the final kingdom of the time of the Gentiles, the kingdom ruling at the time of Christ's return, a reformed kingdom of Rome divided into ten smaller parts, strong but with a mixture of fragility. And I think this is the framework chapter that sets up the rest of these passages. Then the next scripture is Revelation 13, reading from verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast, which is the Antichrist, rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns. Interestingly, seven heads, yet ten crowns. We appear to be three heads short, could these be the three shepherds from Zechariah 11? And on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. And his deadly wound was healed. Keep this mortal head wound in mind for later in the Zechariah 11 prophecy. It's very important. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, who was like the beast? Who was able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's three and a half years for those who can't count in months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. An authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. The next scripture is Daniel 7, reading from verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron, think Roman, 
iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. Think ten toes from Daniel 2. and The ten horns from Revelation 13. I was considering the horns. There was another horn, a little one. For the record, little horn is another name for Antichrist. A little horn coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. Three horns plucked out by the roots. Could this be the three shepherds dismissed or destroyed or cut off from Zechariah 11? And there in his horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. The very same blaspheming beast, the man of Revelation 13. The ten horns are ten kings, who shall arise from his kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. The Antichrist will pluck out, extract, subdue, dismiss, destroy, cut out, three rulers or kings or shepherds. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. That's Bible code for three and a half years or 42 months, the time of the Great Tribulation, the time of Antichrist's unrestrained power. Back to Zechariah 11. I think it's just possible this one dismissing or destroying or cutting off three shepherds in one month is the Antichrist or little horn or beast plucking out three rulers he hates in his rapid rise to world domination. Verse 9, Then I said, I will not feed you. Let what is dying die, and what is perishing perish. Let those who are left eat each other's flesh. Strong language. And I took my staff, beauty, and cut it in two, that I might break the covenant which I have made with all the peoples. Most good Bible commentators say this is predictive of the Roman destruction of Jerusalem and Judea in AD 70. Judea rejected their Messiah, the very Son of God, the Lamb of God, and God surrendered Judea and Jerusalem to devastation. No longer will God bother using his shepherd's crook to guide you. And God breaks his covenant with Israel and unleashes the full fury of Rome on the Jews. There may well be a partial playing out of this prophecy in AD 70, but I think this is fully looking to the time of the end. God will remove both rod and crook from protecting the Jews one final time, three and a half years before Jesus' second coming. During this time, Israel's stubborn rebellion and sin of rejecting Messiah will finally be done away with and perish. By the time of the end of Jacob's trouble, all Israel will repent, acknowledge their guilt of rejecting Messiah. Then all Israel will be saved but only after they've gone through 42 months or three and a half years of the greatest tribulation in human history. It's Antichrist who will break his covenant with all the Gentile nations of the world and with Israel. God isn't a covenant breaker. Antichrist will betray all in his lust for total power. He'll inflict unprecedented tribulation and destruction on all of humanity. So it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Then I said to them, If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages. And if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Verse 11 snaps us back to Zechariah's day with the breaking of the shepherd's crook. You see, it was Zechariah playing out the complicated events he wrote down for us. He was literally acting out in public the complex prophecy we've just read, done before the common man, the poor Jew, 
living in Zachariah's day. All those observing his mesmerizing performance knew this was no ordinary play. This was the very word of God. Zechariah had just acted out the things God intended to happen to the people of Israel and the people of the world. Under the direction of the Holy Spirit, Zechariah requests his wages. They paid the price of a slave, a princely sum. Far too great a price for the acting out of a simple play. But the people were convicted by the word of the Lord. They knew this was a great prophecy of God. So they pay the 30 pieces of silver, perhaps in hope the harsh prophecies played out by Zechariah wouldn't happen to them. And also stunned by the power of this prophecy, though no doubt still full of questions. I'd also like to point out the expression that day in verse 11. That day is hidden Bible code for the day of the Lord. Another hint directing me to believe Zechariah 11 is largely prophecy that plays out during the day of the Lord in our future. The Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Then I cut in two my other staff, bonds, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. Zechariah takes his wages in blind obedience to the Lord and throws this princely price into the temple for the potter. No further explanation is given. Where was the potter? Was he working in the house of the Lord on this particular day? What's written is what happened in Zechariah's day. The play is over. He's paid for his performance. Then God tells him to throw away his biggest payday ever. And because God tells him to do it, Zechariah, the man of God, obeys without question and simply records the details, never knowing the significance of the words or events they foretell. But we know, over five centuries later, a close friend of the true shepherd of Israel, one of only two men in human history to be called the son of perdition, will betray Israel's good shepherd and help the evil leaders of Judah reject and kill their long prayed for good shepherd. The wages of this betrayal, 30 pieces of silver, not the price of a king, but the price of a slave. And in direct replication of the Zechariah actions, the first son of perdition, realizing his guilt of betrayal, will cast the blood money, 30 pieces of silver, into the house of the Lord. And the evil leaders of Israel will use this blood money to buy some land owned by a potter. Just think about the probability, the likelihood of this precise event playing out two times over. Someone is given 30 pieces of silver. They throw it into the house of the Lord and the money ends up in the hands of a potter. But since God exists outside of time, he was able to ensure that Zechariah does the very strange thing then record that very strange thing in a sacred and revered Hebrew prophetic scroll. Then have that same weird and strange thing play out, just as the first son of perdition is helping Israel reject the true shepherd. Then, at the end of the age, the only other man to be called the son of perdition, the Antichrist, is going to also come and present himself to Israel as their Messiah, their true shepherd. But once he has Israel's trust, He'll betray them, as Judas betrayed Jesus after having spent three and a half years with him. In repetition of the first son of perdition, the second son of perdition will betray Israel after three and a half years, 42 months, and then immediately attempt their complete extermination. Events that will ultimately lead all Israel to acknowledge their national guilt of rejecting Messiah. Events that will have them Turn as one people, Judah and Israel recombined and call for the coming of their true Messiah to save them. It's at this point Jesus will come again and cast the Antichrist into the lake of fire, then set up his kingdom on earth, restoring the broken bonds of Israel and Judah, elevating them to their rightful place of prominence over the Gentile nations. It doesn't say what led Zechariah to break the second staff, but he did it to predict the diaspora 
of Israel and Judea. In AD 70, the remnants of Israel and Judah were dispersed across the Roman world. And this scattering, this breaking of the bonds of Judah and Israel, will only be fully reversed once Messiah comes a second time, this time accepted, worshipped and glorified as their king. And the Lord said to me, Next, take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd. For indeed, I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those who are broken, nor feed those that still stand. But he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. The crook and the rod, beauty and unity, which were used for prophetic play-acting by Zechariah, were the very implements Christ used when he came as the Good Shepherd 2,000 years ago. But despised, rejected and crucified, Jesus returned to heaven after defeating the grave. And he'll remain in heaven till all Israel and Judah acknowledge their guilt of rejecting him. So the Lord will give the shepherd's crook and rod to a foolish shepherd, a worthless shepherd, one who is the antithesis of Christ, literally anti-Christ, in place of Christ, and opposed to Christ. This antichrist shepherd will not care for his sheep, but will abuse them, will lie to them, will betray them. He won't pursue the lost to bring them back to safety, but rather pursue the sheep to consume them. He won't seek to restore the broken, He'll be the breaker of hearts. He won't lead them to green pastures to feed, but rather he'll feed himself on the flesh of their fat. He'll use and abuse the flock for every last cent he can extract from them. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. Woe to the worthless shepherd. This is a judgment against all the many worthless shepherds throughout the ages, men entrusted with caring for people under them. Yet it turns out many entrusted with such privilege have been worthless, self-serving, good-for-nothing swines. But the ultimate fulfiller of this worthless shepherd title is Antichrist. Worthless shepherd is one of many nicknames the Antichrist is known by. This verse draws a vivid picture of what Antichrist will look like. He'll be unmissable when he comes. Revelation 13 tells Antichrist will be struck with a mortal sword blow. Someone will slice him with a sword. But by the lying power of Satan, Antichrist will seemingly rise from the dead, probably an evil replication of the true resurrection of Christ. Antichrist will be left with a blind right eye and a completely withered and useless arm following a sword attack against him. And that's where our lesson today concludes. Antichrist, unmasked. You won't miss him when he comes.